Hey, you're tuned in to Resilience Radio with Aaron O'Connell on personal training. My name is Irvin Eisenberg. I'm the show host and owner of Resilience OT. The opinions on this show are not necessarily shared by me. I like to showcase a variety of different perspectives. and Everyone has different needs and different things that resonate with them. Additionally, the show is not meant to be medically diagnostic or prescriptive in any way. In any case, today's guest is Aaron O'Connell, um, personal trainer. Good to have you on. Thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. So could you go into a little bit of what you do? Every personal trainer has got their own focus. Yeah, totally. Um, so what I like to do is craft plans for people who are not usually into fitness. Um, oftentimes, they are the folks that are awkward, afraid, uncomfortable, um, the nerds, the geeks, those folks that just like don't fit into the gym, basically. Um, they often come to me for coaching, and I help them get more comfortable doing movements that they've been wanting to do. Sometimes they're older, sometimes they're younger. So that's kind of the craft that I'm, I'm into in personal training. Okay. And do you do kettlebell works or particular types of strength training? I do work with kettlebells. I also work with maces and a lot of work with just uh, loop resistant spans. Okay. Could you go into what each of those are a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start off with loop resistance bands. They're kind of like those things that everybody sees, the giant rubber bands. Um, but they are phenomenal when it comes to doing all kinds of fun different movements and aiding people when they have uh, trouble doing movements. Um, they really help kind of boost people's performance by um, facilitating a movement that normally they wouldn't be able to do. A kettlebell is, uh, it looks just like a little kettle and it has a handle on it and they're weighted. And so they have a particular dynamic to them where they move um, sort of in unpredictable ways. So your body really has to stabilize them a lot more. Um, and then the mace that I use is um, originates from India and it is uh, a ball head basically on a long shaft or a stick basically. So it's, um, it's really good for shoulder work and it feels really powerful. It's good for if you want to like chop wood or um, it's just a lot of fun to play with. So those are the typical tools that I use with folks. So it sounds like you work with a variety of different people. Would you say you have a particular, uh, a, a typical client? Ah, typical client. Um, the people that I'm working with the most currently are older. Um, I, I'm working with somebody who's well into her 70s and doing excellent work with her um, and somebody else who's in her mid 60s and she's working on power lifting. Um, and I've worked with people all the way down to 13 so far. So, Okay. So, so beyond... Um sort of saying that you're um, open to working with people that are that might not f typically fit um, into the typical gym setting what what actually separates you in, in your in how in your approach and your approachability oh um, I think a lot of people really find me comfortable to work with I'm a small person <laughs> and um, I don't look like the typical gym goer um, and I've got some experience in powerlifting for my um, size and presentation back in college. And, uh, and people just feel really comfortable around me. And I think that that's where um, the lack of feeling like they have to like size up to me or like be somebody other than who they are is really what draws them to me. And that, that feels really different to people. Okay. So, so what got you on this path? Where, how did you end up? becoming a trainer? Yeah. Um, I started off um, lifting weights when I was four years old. My dad was a bodybuilder. And um, so I started really young, just picking things up and putting them down, heavy things for a four-year-old. And from there, um, I got into just all kinds of different movement practices from soccer and uh, running, cross country, basketball. Um, but then in college, I started powerlifting with my dad. And um, got pretty serious about it. I started getting some records, holding uh, a couple in Vermont. And um, from there, I noticed that I was starting to get really sore after workouts. Um, but I still just like was in that mentality of push, 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 push. Um, after college, I started doing CrossFit, and it was even more push, push, push. And at that point, I started to realize like this 
it really just wasn't working for my body. Like I didn't want to feel sore all the time. Um, so it was then, and after I had a gender affirming surgery that I was like, I need to do something more in balance. And I took a kettlebell class and realized that that felt more comfortable for me, but I was also missing some mobility aspects and um, started learning about how to do myofascial release and um, started following uh, some professionals in that arena. And doing that really helped me kind of balance the lifting the weights and the mobility piece that I was lacking before in powerlifting. Um, and so those are the two kind of aspects that I bring into my coaching is that um, the strength piece and, and really kind of focusing in on where people can improve their strength uh, in a really safe and mobile way and bringing that mobility piece in so that way they do them in a consistent and strong, safe way. So you mentioned in there having a gender affirming surgery. I did. So in what in what ways do you feel like either the culture of there's sort of two different directions I'm thinking of sort of asking this question the the culture of weightlifting and the very clear gender norms that I mean it's considered more of a masculine thing in general though there's plenty of and but the differences in um sort of clear trajectories of, of, and of sports in general, having such a clear gendered um, women's sports, men's sports thing. Do you have anything to speak to that? Totally. Um, yeah. When I was powerlifting, I um, was uh, presenting in a female body, let's say, um, although I was very masculine presenting even then. And um, I really struggled being accepted um, just in, in sports in general, presenting kind of as a masculine looking person, but being uh, designated female at birth. Um, and so in soccer, I was always teased and in cross country, I was questioned and then in powerlifting, I was made fun of. Um, and so it got really, for me, it, it became a kind of like, why is there all this binary and why can't I feel comfortable in a place where like I clearly want to be doing this movement with people um, and have it be a community and still feel kind of left out and ostracized basically for these kind of binary ideas. Um, and so it, I really wanted to incorporate in my coaching that all bodies are really welcome like to, to join me in movement, basically, um, because I don't want anybody to feel like they can't move because they're made fun of or because they don't fit the presentation that they, you know, they're, quote unquote, supposed to have. Um, and so that's why I, I bring that up um, with people when, when they're like, you know, I just don't feel comfortable presenting as I am, so I don't go to the gym. And I, I really want people to be able to have that movement for themselves. Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, you're not, at least when you're talking about the type of gym work you're doing, you're not talking about competitive sports, but um, are you currently involved in any competitive sports or is that much of it? How much of your history was competitive sports? I know that you, you mentioned some of them. Yeah, uh, a big history it was for me was in competitive sports, um, for sure. Uh, everything from running, soccer, basketball, it was all, all competitive powerlifting. Um, but I no longer do competitive sports. I'll coach people um, with competitive sports and we talk about how it would be nice to have like a more comprehensive or holistic approach to how um, people can kind of compete in these things without feeling like they have to be a certain presentation or feel like they can't compete or feel questioned when they compete and, and have it be more composite rather than specific like binary things. So, yeah. So I was listening to a piece, I think it was from Radio Lab, talking about um, some of the sort of for sort of gender and and sports and talking about sort of the quandary that if you if you put the world's best um, the world's best soccer players women's soccer players up against pretty much any college boys team, the boys are likely going to win. And that there is, there is, that's just sort of a, a reality. And that if you open up the sort of the, everyone can compete together, then it actually sort of boxes out um, almost every woman. 
So I guess to me, I, I've been sort of like, wow, I'm, I'm glad I'm not enough involved in sports that this is um, <laughs> that this is a quandary moving forward in a in, in a in a world as we acknowledge um, less binary. Um, what where does that leave competitive sports? And do you have what's your image? What would you like to see for that? I like I I honestly really don't like competition. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's an and easy it, solution. <laughs> it, it's, it's, yeah, right. It took me a long time to recognize that, though. Um, I, I mean, one of the, one of the quotes that I, I think I sent you was that from Jiddu Krishnamurti, who was basically like, "Competition destroys the self." Um, to put it succinctly, uh, his was a little more extensive. But I mean, when I pit myself up against somebody else, I'm already destroying an aspect of myself. Um, and that is something that it took me a long time to kind of reconcile and that I no longer wanted to um, approach fitness, exercise, movement in that kind of way. I wanted it to be joyful. Competition really took the joy out of things for me. Um, and and by just like being present with movement and moving my body and feeling the exhilaration of like, oh, I wasn't able to do that before and now I can even though it's not really like self-competition, it's more of the excitement of saying, ah, there's capability um, rather than like, I, I need to reach this next level because, you know, at some point I learned I plateau or I top out and, and then what, where, what am I left with? Yet, you know? So that's where I, I wanted to be in my movement practice was just feeling the joy of, of being present with it and not needing to, put myself against somebody else and have somebody else put themselves against me. And, and that, that sort of, again, binary idea of, of how movement is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I think some uh, sort of a theme that's come up in the different interviews I've been doing this season with movement practitioners in particular is sort of the best movement is the one that you want to do and, and finding joy in that movement. And it seems like what you're saying is completely in line with, I think every other movement practitioner I've talked about, you've got a, a different slant on it, but it's the same tenets of that's moving is such a personal thing and should be joyful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want it to be joyful for, for anybody that works with me as much as possible. And, and I think that's what I really get out of it is seeing that when they can let go of like these ideals that we all have, which are great ideals. It would be lovely to look a certain way and, and, you know, be able to do all these crazy things. And at the same time, the reality is, is, is what's really, what am I really getting out of that? And is my, is my, am I going to put myself in the position where I have to change literally everything to get that one moment um, and it doesn't last very long. This is all very temporary. So I'd rather find constant enjoyment with movement as it comes rather than th that one moment, which I've definitely experienced. And it just goes away in a flash. So <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about the quote you were saying, and I'm and having only read it once or twice, I'm certainly not going to be able to quote it properly. But the it brought to mind a couple of things. One was sort of reading some um, Aikido instructor said, don't copy what I'm doing, copy what I'm trying to do. So it was that idea of, of sort of not idolizing your, um, your instructor or, but understanding the premise of what they're, what they're moving towards. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Aikido, yeah. And Aikido being so rooted in sort of Buddhist philosophy and <laughs> enlightenment and nothingness, I'm, I'm guessing they would, there they might be things to say from that standpoint of, oh yeah, but you, you attain it and then it goes away and that's, kind of the point but it's but it's also not comparing to others is what i got from that and the other is just thinking about um not to brush all yoga with the same <laughs> with the paint in the same stroke but the um but i feel like there is such a culture of yoga which we think of as non-competitive is such a people go to class and they want to look a certain way and they want to be able to do the stretch as deep as the instructor and compare constantly comparing themselves. And I know that even though I'm a fairly self-confident person and am okay being not, not being like those around me, whenever I'm in a movement class, I'm the, the constant comparing to other of self to others is like, it's our basis. It's how we, 
how we sort of identify ourselves within a group and our skill set. Like, am I getting better at this? Am I not? Um, am I practice? Am I progressing faster than this other person? And it's this constant <laughs> <laughs> comparison. Yeah. And it runs and it runs and it runs. It's a, I've found that it takes a real, um, it's a real wonder to feel that moment of humility where I can accept where I'm at and be okay with it. And um, helping people kind of see where they're actually at and being having them feel like this is actually really okay. Like who I am is really okay. Like I'm, I'm good. I'm actually really good where I am and, and have them be like, that's, that's actually a wonderful thing to experience for them because everything around us tells us that we're not okay. And we're not whole as we are. And when somebody can say like, my body is not going to perform the way I wish it could right now. And I'm, I'm great with that. And it's doing really wonderful things where it is. It's just, it's just amazing. It's amazing to see. So I guess, how do you, um, it's, it's very rare that I hear of a, a trainer basically saying you're good where you are. It's almost like, well, what's, <laughs> I, I could see that, training, I, right? yeah, I could see that being like a, a complacency. It's like, okay, I'll stay right here on the couch. <laughs> how do you <laughs> balance those two things? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I do is I like to find the edges with people. I like to find where they, they, they know where they want to be. And for me, it's like, okay, this is, this is the like big picture of where they would really like to be. How can I bring it to where we find that first edge and, and kind of see like, where do you start to feel this being a client? Where would they start to feel kind of uncomfortable with where they think they want to go and how they're going to get there? Um, and so a lot of the time, it's just kind of playing with those edges and, and seeing like, all right, for my 75 year old client, she really wanted to work on balance and was starting to get become afraid of the stairs. Well, it's like, how can I work with your edges and have you feel more comfortable doing these balance movements and then have you feel comfortable going up and down the stairs and, you know, just working on ways to have her achieve those goals and still know that like she needs to put in some of the work to do that like it's it's still it's always kind of movement in the sense that like in order for something to change change needs to start to happen so what strategies do you do to help motivate people i mean just coming to you in and of itself shows that someone's motivated to want to work but yeah absolutely absolutely um everybody's got their own kind of motivation uh, for me, as a trainer, it's important for me to kind of see what helps people a achieve their goals. Either it's time management or text messages or saying, like, we're going to meet on this day. I start to figure out each person's individual needs. And some people respond really well to feedback. And other people are like, do I get a cookie at the end of the week? And is that OK? And I can say, yeah, absolutely. Um I'm a really easygoing person, obviously, uh, and at the same time, I do have qu quite a fair amount of discipline because it, it takes a lot of discipline to have power powerlifting records being held and like you know competitive sports and all that um, to show up. And a big step is just getting people to show up. And so I know that they're ready when they're coming to me and saying like, "All right, I'm I'm going to do this and I'm going to show up for this" because they're really showing up for themselves. And so that's what I help remind them is that these, this is where they want to go, and, and I can help take them there. And and it's really like they're rooting for themselves, and I just reflect that back to them. Mm -hmm. So some of the um, personal trainers I've talked to over the years will really emphasize some dietary recommendations alongside their work. And um, I won't get into my opinions on that yet. I'm curious where, <laughs> where do you stand with, with, with diet and working out? Yeah. Um, I encourage people to eat. That's what I do. I really don't enjoy calling anything a diet per se. Um, but I do encourage people to eat and to play with their food. <laughs> and what I mean is, is, again, when we listen to our bodies, when we find what brings us joy and we do things in moderation and balance, 
the system as a whole, the body as a whole, will find balance. And so if somebody, you know, is like, this is how I eat, I ask them to do like a, a mindfulness practice for a few days and, and send it to me. Um, and just that reflection oftentimes kind of helps them come back to balance. Um, if they have a goal, I'll work with them to kind of tailor things for that goal. And uh, if they don't, I encourage them to just to play with what food is like for them. You know, it, does it feel really good to eat late at night? Probably not. Does it feel good to eat a balanced meal? Probably so. And some people will say like, you know, I've listened to my body and I know like these foods really work for me. And I say, okay, then let's work out a, a meal plan for you that like does that for you. Okay. I've had, in addition to, um, to movement people, I've had um, nutritionists and such on and I've, and I feel like both of the, the both the dietitian and the nutritionist would probably be be nodding approval to, to what you said, though. <laughs> I won't speak on their behalf. <laughs> yeah. Some people question the amount of pastries I eat. But um, <laughs> again, it's all in balance and moderation is the way I approach it. So, Well, do you have any... Um advice for someone who would like to be working out more and isn't quite sure what what their next step should be? Yeah. Um, if somebody wants to be working out more, um, I really like to look at what they're doing for current movements and where they feel like their limitations are in their current movements um, and kind of play around with things and also to have fun. There's so many cool like movement and exercise practices out there. It's just amazing to go out and experiment with you know, all different kinds of things. Um, I started rock climbing and that's been incredible. Um, and there's lots of strength training workouts that go along with that. And I'm sure with paddle boarding, there's a whole other sect of things that somebody could do as well. Um, so my advice is to, to play, find the things that bring you happiness and joy. Um, and then once you found the thing that that you can play with and enjoy, find movements that correspond to that and collaborate together with that. And they, they integrate and they'll build upon each other. And, and that's really like the wonder of, of, you know, both movement and exercise is they go really well hand in hand. And I can take a movement like roller skating and find exercises for people to do, you know? And at the same time, I can take exercising and apply it to, how to play roller derby, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if someone wants to get a hold of you or reach out to you, what, what are your offerings right now? And I mean, some people might not be listening to this when COVID is quite as strict as it is now, and that's changing, but where, where is it now and where do you see it being? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do work with people directly in person um, with a lot of COVID precautions in place. So distanced, oftentimes outside. Um, I'll do it in the cold if somebody's willing, but not too many people have been. <laughs> um, but right now I've been online um, and people can reach me both on Instagram and through my website, which is fitfolks.com. Um, I'll put that in the show notes as well for anyone who's interested. Cool. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I'm, I do group classes every once in a while and I'll post those up as well. So people can join remotely. I've done a couple of those and they've been really successful and had, had a few people join from Colorado and all over the place, which is fun. So how frequently would you like to be, if when you're coming up with a fitness plan, and I'm imagining based on what you've said before, that's going to vary quite a bit. Um, what's your recommendation for someone who wants to get started? Um, Oh, my recommendation is to really look at how much time you're willing to put into this. <laughs> um, so look, I say, look at, look at the schedule and see, you know, if I can only do 20 minutes a day, then I would do 20 minutes every day for, you know, a few days on and a couple days off. Um, if I can put in an hour or two a week then finding those days that I can put that hour or two a week. Um, and again, for me, it depends on each person's goal. Um, I like to work out, twice a week 
for an hour each time. And that feels like enough for me for my current goals. If I wanted to change that, I would just start adding things and making sure to take time to rest too, because that's one thing that I've noticed people uh, like get really gung ho about doing exercise and movement and they forget to like actually listen to the body and rest and take time and, and, um, and mobilize, <laughs> mobilize. Yes, it's interesting. People forget that the uh, while you're working out, you're degrading your tissue. It's the rest that heals it <laughs> and and builds it. Yeah, exactly. Have you um, worked with people who you would refer to as sort of exercise addicts, people who are way overdoing it, and you're having to sort of like help ease them off? Um, I would say one client that I'm currently work, working with uh, would probably formally call herself an exercise addict. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how to wean them off. It's about slowing down. Um, it's about bringing mindfulness to their movement. It's about appreciating the things that they are doing. Um, again, the coming from a place of, of, and knowing addiction really well, <laughs> um, there's a lot of perfectionism involved in that. And um, it, for me, it took a lot to see where it's okay to be imperfect and where it's okay to slow things down and where it's okay to be present with what's actually happening and not someplace else in the mind. Um, and I think that's that's been one of the key things for working with this, this particular person is just being really aware of um, how it, how it, it's important to care for the body and it's not just about, you know, attaining something. It's about being. So do you have any closing thoughts or advice for the, the general audience? I always encourage people to play. Um, that's, that's the thing that brings the most youth and joy and presence into our lives. Um, and oftentimes we feel like there's not enough of it. So find ways to play and and that will show you the direction of your movements well thank you so much for coming on today Aaron. thanks for having me that was our conversation with Aaron o'connell this is resilience radio if you enjoyed this episode please subscribe and you can get a new episode with a different um healthcare practitioner or researcher every week um you've been listening to resilience radio I hope you enjoyed.